Hey guys, welcome to another edition of Satellites Does Youth Alpha. I'm Martin. I'm Charles. You knew that already. And for the next half an hour or so, uh, we're going to be asking some of the big questions about life and what it's all about. Um, we've got a few questions for you. We're going to kick off with one of those right away. Um, so, look, we're going to start the ball rolling here. We are massive fans of a certain time travel based TV show. Is that right? Yes. For both of us. Yeah. What's who's on the uh, who's on the shirt today? Uh, this is Back to the Future, actually. <gasps> well, that works perfectly. So we're thinking about time travel. We're both big fans of time travel shows and movies. Yeah. Doctor Who. Yes. Maybe not the last couple of seasons, but apart from that, love Doctor, love time travel. Love yeah. the concept of time travel. Yeah. Love the idea that you could go back through time, see anything, and or into the future. And like maybe even do stuff that changes the past or the future. Really interesting stuff. Charles, if you could go back to any time in history, where would you go and what would you do? Okay, so I have like two complicated answers for this. The first answer is quite on topic. I'd probably go back to when Jesus was around. Oh, yeah. And see like what happened, what went down, witness a few miracles. The second one is... I actually would probably just travel back like a few years backwards because like in a way life has never been better than it is now in terms <laughs> of technology and stuff. Wow. Like if you go back to Jesus's days, like you're pooing on the street. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like hygiene wise, I wouldn't cope going too far back. You would not cope five minutes <laughs> in a poo on the street culture. <laughs> oh no. If, if there was any chance of like poo being chucked out of the window in buckets, yeah. you know, like you see an old like... No, I, I would, I'd just be constantly looking up. You would? And looking, like, no, I can do it. <laughs> I love, I mean, that's a movie. That's a movie right there. <laughs> Charles Merrick gets sent back into biblical times and has to dodge poop. Yeah. What about you? I mean, I'm, I, I just want to see that. I just want to okay. travel back and see that. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, you don't, um, we've never had it so good in terms of technology and comfort but it would be interesting to go back to the time of the ancient Britons mm. and uh, particularly, I'm um, thinking um, King Alfred the Great, that kind of time when the Viking hordes were attacking and you had all the kind of the armies of different parts of England kind of fighting each other and fighting. I mean, I would want to be up a tree somewhere. I wouldn't want to actually yeah. be down on ground level and there'd be poo coming out windows all over the place. <laughs> but I, quite, I love that period in history. It's very interesting. Yeah. You know who got me into that? Harry McIntyre. Because I watched his TV show and it's all about that. Yeah. That's interesting-ish. Uh, so, so that's one question. But here's a different question, okay? If you could go back in time and give your past self some advice that perhaps would change some things. You know, if you could go back and give your past self some advice, Charles, what would, what would you, when would you go back to and what would you say? I'd probably tell my seven-year-old self to not give up piano. And to carry on playing piano and learn it properly. Because at some point you're going to sit at the piano and only be able to play chords and it's going to sound awful and not as good. I can't tell whether that's a metaphor. No, it's a genuine thing. I I wish I could play piano properly. It's a great answer. What's yours? Now, obviously, time travel's not real. What? I know. We can't change the past, but we can make the most of our future. And I think if I went back in time, that's what I would probably have said to myself. I said, don't worry. You'll make the most of the future. Don't worry about the fact that at the moment, being a teenager sucks. When you go forward, life can be better. That's probably what I would have said. So we can live a life that is totally fulfilling. And like that is the life that God wants us to have. That's the life that we are talking about when we invite you to follow Jesus, a life that is totally fulfilling in a really awesome way. And in the Bible, we've said this before, Jesus says, I have come that they might have life in all its fullness. Or in another translation, I've come that they might have life to the full. Like the fullest possible experience of life comes through living God's way. That's John 10, verse 10. And we talked um, in a previous episode about how that means more than just enjoying your day, like having 
pleasant or pleasurable experiences. It's about this deeper sense of meaning and purpose um, that gives us fulfillment. So Charles is a trained actor, and so I'm going to get you to do a little bit of improv here, Charles. So uh, Charles, imagine that you are going to spend a day at your favourite place on Earth, Mm -hmm. Disneyland, on your favourite roller coaster. Oh, yeah. And just do, just do Charles Merritt on that first ride, enjoying himself on the, on the roller coaster. Perfect. Okay. There are other people in the building. <laughs> that might... I hope that hasn't ruined anyone's recording upstairs. They no. may come down now. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Charles. Exactly what I wanted. Okay, so that is Charles, his favourite place on earth, after a day. Okay, now let's do, Charles, you've now been there for a week. Okay. Okay, and you've been riding around the different rides. It's your last day at Disneyland. Give me Charles Merritt on the same roller coaster after a week. So you'll see Charles is still enjoying himself. I mean, Charles looks a little bit like a scary ghost zombie, but that's often the case. The part. I see. But, um, but, but now we're going to do a final uh, mm. version just for comparison. Yeah. Okay, so now, Charles, you've been on the same ride for a year. Okay? Yeah. Let's see Charles, <laughs> let's see Charles Merritt on the same roller coaster one year on. Mm. <laughs> Didn't get into drama school. Such range, darling. Didn't get into drama school. I don't understand that. So so ultimately, the point is this. You may have seen it coming. There's stuff that gives us short-term pleasure, but ultimately it doesn't give us long-term contentment. That deeper sense of like happiness and life to the full isn't achieved by just doing the fun stuff of the world. Whatever it is, believe me. What, and whatever version of that you want to come up with, it's the same answer. So you'll find people who've had like massive amounts of sex with lots of different people, like Russell Brand. And he will tell you that has been an incredibly unfulfilling life for him. Like he's talked openly about the fact that he wishes he hadn't done that. Um, but you might think, oh yeah, okay, forget that though. But I just want to get loads of money so I can have as much stuff as possible. And, um, and actually, there's loads of people who've had that and then realized that when you get all that stuff, there's just, there's just nothing there except the quest for more stuff. There's no fulfillment to be had in having a big house. You just want a bigger house because there's always a guy with a bigger house. There's always a guy with a faster uh, car or, a, you, know, you know what I mean? That's, there's never fulfillment. Jim Carrey, who um, was recently seen in the movie Sonic the Hedgehog, was? said that he hopes or he wishes that everybody could just have everything they ever wanted so that they could realise it's not the answer. Which I think is a really fascinating quote. Ultimately, like these short-term pleasurable things that the world around us tells us, this is what you should live for. Work and earn money so you can have these things. Ultimately, it doesn't make you happy. Uh, like, uh, like day one, Charles, it mm. makes you feel a bit dead, like, like day 365, Charles. Thanks for your help with that, no mate. That was, that was excellent. We might have some more drama uh, opportunities for you later on. So Paul in Romans 12 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Then he says this. This is a really important bit. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, we've had, we had that as a holiday club memory verse, if we you did. remember. It was awesome. But um, to conform to the pattern of this world essentially means trying to go for all that stuff we were just talking about. Trying to like root your happiness in having more stuff, in having a great career, in having loads of money, in being as attractive as you possibly can. Uh, all that stuff. That's what is the pattern of this world. That's what's being offered. But Paul says, don't conform to that. Don't go for that. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how do you renew your mind? It's by knowing Jesus. That's what that looks like. So in other words, the right way to live, God's perfect way in all its fullness, isn't like the way the rest of the world lives. Don't conform to the way everyone else does it. Be transformed by knowing God. But of course, 
it's not that easy, is it? Because the whole world around us is chasing after the proverbial Disneyland. Mm. I mean, not, not literally, but, but in some way. And it's hard to change that, uh, especially when you're used to living one way and everyone else around us is doing the same way. So there's this little film we're going to watch now, um, which is produced by the guys at Youth Alpha, um, which puts a really interesting take on that. There was an old woman who day by day walked the streets on which she lived. She was well known for carrying dozens of plastic bags full of trash everywhere she went. She was also notorious for pestering passers-by for money and would be very aggressive to anyone who refused her request for cash. As a result, she didn't make many friends. The day came when the old lady passed away, and you would expect that her funeral would be a very small occasion. But surprisingly, a huge crowd gathered, all kinds of well-dressed relatives, top executives, not to mention lots and lots of lawyers. It turned out that while the woman was living on the streets, she had inherited a huge fortune, including a very luxurious apartment that was filled with dozens of extremely valuable paintings. But strangely, the woman had chosen to continue to live on the street, just her and her plastic bags full of trash. Apparently, she didn't want to leave behind the life she knew, and so she never got to enjoy her extraordinary inheritance. So, Charles, that last question there, how, um, how have you felt pressure to fit in? Have you kind of had experiences of, of peer pressure, even living, trying to live God's way, where you've thought, oh, gosh, I've, I'm going to kind of conform to what my friends want to do? Um, yeah, I think there is, there's been moments where I've wanted to be more attractive or, like, work out. I've never done it in a, in a public sense of going to the gym with people, um, but in my bedroom, like, I'd be like, I've got to work out. And like, I would do, like, a few press-ups and I'd be like, yeah, I've done my job. That's it. That's going to get me ripped for the rest of my life. And it doesn't. And then I studied these track. That was pretty... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I had a very different experience when I was at university. Um, I uh, had a group of friends who... There was lots of kind of male bravado going on. And it was with a group of friends. I'd just made friends. And they were all talking about all the uh, sexual relationships they'd had. I've talked about this before on a um, on Man You Made To Be podcast, which if you've never uh, watched or listened to, it's pretty much like this, but with less kind of youth alpha content. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, I've talked about it on there, but, but if you haven't heard the story, like I basically was a total chump and I, I just, just, just to try to fit in, I claimed that I'd had loads of these sexual relationships. And then a few weeks later, when my best friend from home came up to stay, and they were all like, wow, Martin's had all these girls. And he was like, no, he hasn't. <laughs> He's like a really like strong Christian. He wouldn't do any of that. And I looked like a total idiot in front of my friends. And my friends, of course, said to me at the time, like, why don't you just, why don't you just stand for the thing you stand for? Um, maybe I need to let go of this a little bit. But, but certainly that was what it was like for me to really try and fit in with friends. And ultimately, like, I don't believe that that would have, even if I had done that, that wouldn't have made me any happier. That wouldn't have made me maybe a more fulfilled person but I felt the pressure to conform. So I understand that it's not easy when we say to you, don't conform to what the world wants. Don't try to live for parties and have like really reckless kind of attitudes around um, drinking and sex and all sorts of other stuff. We know it's not an easy thing to say. It's a very hard thing to say, but it is totally worth, um, you know, if, you've, if you are going to follow Jesus, if you're going to put God in the middle of your life, if you really are going to say, you know, it's, it's, God is real and I want to follow him, then don't be half-hearted. Like, that's, that's sort of pointless, isn't it? Half-hearted Christianity is, 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 is worse than no Christianity. I mean, it actually says that in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. You know, it's worse, you're basically worse than no Christianity. Um, and so what, what life in all its fullness really looks like is actually like involving God in every part of our lives. Now, I'm going to break from youth alpha, the youth alpha bit a bit here and, and we're going to be a bit more heavy on the satellites 
kind of bit here because uh, as you know we've been talking about this in our group here for the last couple of years but um, we're now working towards the summer festival satellites festival in 2021 august 10th 14th make sure your parents don't book a holiday um and um and and at that we're really talking about what it looks like for you to put god at the center of your life and that really that's like the main point the main idea is how do we live with god at the center of our our lives don't worry there'll also be football and burger vans but that's the (laughs) not not in following jesus or maybe in following jesus but um but, but that's really the key idea is that, um, is that in order to experience this life in all of its fullness that Jesus talks about, we have to see God right in the middle of everything we do, right in the midst of every part of our lives. So what does that actually mean? What does that look like? We say that a lot. Well, it means that when you go to school and you pass the church centre on your walk up to school, if that happens to be you, you... Um, that's not the only engagement you're going to have with God over the day because God, God's not just waving at you from the church building as you pass it. I do. <laughs> do you wave to the church? Yeah, if you walk past our Oh, office, Charles waves at you. I will wave at you. Is that why the police were here? Yeah. So, um, so that's not the only time that you engage with God. Like, God is interested in your first period of the day and your last period of the day. He's interested in your lunch break. He's interested in sport. He's interested in being a part of everything. And what that looks like, you know, that's a bigger question. But but God is absolutely in the midst of every part of our lives. And what it means to follow him is to recognize that, is to recognize that, that I don't stop being a Christian just because I'm on the hockey pitch or because I'm now doing a history lesson or meeting with my friends. I don't stop being Christian. And God isn't just safely in his box at church. He's with me the whole time. Um, we're going to ask another question, and then we've got, um, we've got a few uh, last bits to do. So, um, so we're going to do the question first. And, and, and this, is, um, this is really the other, the other side to what it, what it means to put, live with God at the center of our lives. Because not only does he just want to kind of be in everything, he's also got a plan for us. He's also got a purpose um, and he's got things for us to do in the world. And so uh, we want to ask you what, what it feels like for you, uh, this idea that God has a purpose for your life. Great. We are going to um, watch an interview now with, and this is an amazing interview, with a guy who has really stepped into this idea of putting God at the centre of his life. So um, he's somebody who definitely wasn't living God's way. He was chasing after all the other stuff that we were talking about. And then he had a moment of realisation. And to see what he's done, what God has done with his life, this purpose that God has had for his life as a result, this is what it looks like to enter into your life in all its fullness. Watch this. I grew up as an only child. Um, I was the good church kid. At 18, like so many bad cliches, I rebelled. I became uh, a nightclub promoter. And over the next 10 years, from uh, about 18 to 28, really climbed up New York's social ladder. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. Uh, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, uh, I had a Rolex, I had a Labrador Retriever, I had a grand piano in my apartment in New York, and I was so unhappy. Something awakened in me, something, I, it was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. There would never be enough girls, there'd never be enough drugs, there'd never be enough parties. I guess it was a fresh look, being able to take a look at faith again with fresh eyes. And I became so compelled by uh, a Jesus who went around serving the poor, who went around looking after others and, and lived a life of integrity. You know, this is verse uh, in James that I came across that said, true religion is to look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. So I was 0 for 2. Uh, not only had I done nothing for the poor in a decade, I literally polluted people for a living. I made this radical, uh, radical life move. I wound up selling all of my possessions. I joined this humanitarian mission, a group of medical doctors volunteering in West Africa, operating on a huge hospital ship, and I become their photojournalist. I saw a lot of stuff uh, over those two years, and I think the thing that struck me the most was people drinking dirty water. 
Half of the country didn't even have their most basic need for health men. Half the country didn't have clean water to drink. And when I landed back in New York, I was 30. And this was the issue that I felt so compelled to work on. Charity Water was definitely birthed out of my faith experience, of, of me returning back to Christ, to, um, to God again. And, it, you know, I believe that the idea of Charity Water is very close to God's heart. I believe the idea of a world where every single person drinks clean water is, is so fluid, is so in line with the heart of, of God, the heart of the Father. Uh, and, and it's an amazing thing to be able to do with, with my work. Over the last nine years, we've raised almost $200 million. Uh, we've helped over 5.5 uh, million people around the world get access to clean water. So we've made a little bit of a dent. Uh, and, and most importantly, the number of people without water has come down from a billion to 660 million. You know, if I look back on it, I think this idea of really trying to serve God through my work, um, you know, has changed everything in my life. But I think, you know, you can do that wherever you are, whether you're a banker, whether you're a florist, um, you can bring, you know, the, the kingdom values that you believe in into your work, into the way that you, you serve your customers, into the way that you lead uh, your team members, uh, into the way that you, um, you support others. What an, ama what an amazing story. So good. So inspiring. Um, that's what it looks like when um, we serve God first. Uh, we know this stuff is not easy. Um, it, we have to let go of the stuff that we used to live for. And that's not, that's not an easy thing, is it? I mean, no. have you ever tried to, you know, ask someone to stop doing something that they like doing? Yeah. I mean, it's, they don't like it. No. I don't like it. If I say to you, Charles, stop watching that Stranger Things marathon. Make me! <laughs> yeah, you see? Yeah. People don't like that. If I say, Charles, stop building that Lego princess kingdom. Never! Yes, you see. Sorry, you're just touch, touching a lot on my back. Wow, I feel like we're bringing some stuff up here. This is suddenly counselling. Um, we, we don't like being told to stop living one way. But the reason we, um, we, we, we invite you to do that is because the life that you could step into is so much greater. Greater even than a Stranger Things marathon. Or a Lego Disney castle. Absolutely. Um, it's also hard, I don't know if you find this, to, to, to let people around us know that we're living differently. So that was true of my story earlier on. But, you know, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Like the, peer, the, the, the social embarrassment that can come from, like, admitting you're, like, a Christian. Like, it's a real thing. Like, we should be honest about it. And yeah. some, guy, some of you guys are amazing at it, but, but the rest of us find it pretty hard. Um, and so we recognise that that's hard, too. Um, but honestly, um, what we want to say today, this is our key point, really. Following God's way is the only way that you will be truly happy in your life. It is the only way to truly be transformed um, so that you can live life in the fullest way imaginable, the fullest way that you were created to live, to be the person you were made to be. Ding, ding, ding. Goodbye. I'm just glad that you didn't let me act out the sex bit. <laughs> <laughs>